Welcome to Hardware Asylum. When I set out on my retro PC adventure that you're watching here on the Hardware Asylum YouTube channel, I had two goals in mind. The first was to explore some old vintage hardware that fascinated me as a kid, namely the RLL and MFM hard drives. At the time, these hard drives were extremely expensive. They did not offer very much storage, and they were relatively slow, at least by today's standards. My second goal was to explore the performance of these machines and determine if there was a way that they could be modernized, not necessarily to make a sleeper PC, but more or less to use vintage hardware and then add some modern components, the typical resto mod. By this video, I've done quite a bit with the Microscience hard drives. One of the first videos was me repairing one where I took the lid off and replaced the solenoid inside because of a typical problem with the self park not releasing. After that I was able to take one of those drives and put it into the classic case build that was a 38640 MHz. I urge you to go check out the video. I'll put a link down in the description below. This adventure also got me into doing a little bit of 3D printing and I wanted to draw your attention to one of the items that's been in the background here in the Hardware Asylum Labs. This project was basically a hard drive cover designed to look like a Microscience HH hard drive, complete with the activity light and the basic look and feel. Same size, same dimensions. Inside though, we have a standard SSD, which was using the SATA interface. I'm using a SATA to IDE adapter to convert it into an IDE based hard drive. I hooked up the activity LED and of course it worked great. Unfortunately the implementation of this particular project was not really what I was looking for. The model that I used was all in one piece and required a lot of support. Unfortunately it took about 24 hours to print and maybe 30 to 40 percent of the plastic that needed to be printed had to be removed just so that I could use the device. Of course in the end I was able to do a bit of painting on it make it look like the finished model. And while I find that this project was a success and really deserves its own video, it's not the focus that I would like to talk about. The intention for version two is to take things to the next level. And what better way to create a sleeper storage solution than to use actual vintage hardware in that project. And for this, I've taken one of my broken microscience drives in that pack that I got, this is the one drive that didn't want to spin up. It didn't seem to want to activate at all. And later when I took it apart, I found out that the hard drive had crashed. The heads had basically contacted the platters and it wasn't going to do anything. And for that, I took the frame off the outside. This is what holds the drive to the cage, allowing you to install it into a computer. We took the faceplate off with the activity LED and we're going to be using the lid as well. All of the original mounting hardware, including the rubber dampers and the screws are going to be used in this project. And to hook everything together, we're going to be 3D printing some parts. This is something that I was able to create in AutoCAD. You can see a model here. It's broken up into two pieces. I learned from the previous project that we really want to do stuff without a lot of support structure. Not only does it take time to print, but it takes time to also clean up. So the top part will interface with the lid. I was able to model it exactly so that when the lid was placed on top, I can put the screws in, tighten them into the available holes. And there are some thin tabs that will interface with the rubber mounts on the outside. The bottom part is the business end of this particular project. And I've given myself provisions for pass through power an IDE gender changer so that I can hook up the IDE interface. We're going to have an IDE to SATA interface card, which I'll show a little bit later. And we have options for either a SATA to SD card adapter or a standard SSD. So let's get on to the assembly stage. I've already done the modification on the SATA to IDE adapter. I have two of them here. And if you look carefully, you might be able to tell what it was that I changed. This is the factory part, and as you can see, there's an activity LED on the board itself. And on my modified board, I've added a couple of pin headers, and that will allow me to remotely connect the activity LED to the front of the new drive cage. 
On the front of the bezel, this is where the activity LED is, and on the back we have the factory connection. This goes into the control board itself, and here's the back side of the LED itself. We could pop this out, but I don't want to risk it not going back in, so I think what we're going to do is just strip back these wires, and we'll put on a new lead. The lead that I'm using is a salvage part. This is one of those old school thermal probes. So this would go into the thermal sensor device and then the probe itself was on this end and I just cut it off. We have a length of wire that will fit our device. Now we just need to solder the wires onto here. When I modeled the base plate, I wanted to make sure that there were enough shells around each one of the holes. So I modeled it slightly small so that I can drill this out to accept the screw. Be able to cut in some threads so that we can basically secure everything together. So our next step will be to drill this hole out slightly so that we can get our factory screws threaded in. The next holes we need to drill are conditioning to accept a 632 standard case screw. That's how, that's how our adapter is going to get secured into the drive. Basically, the screw goes in the hole, just like that. For this, we'll be using an eighth inch drill bit. And I'll be going in just a little ways down, just enough not to split or bind up the post. Perfect. I use this exact same procedure when I'm building the IDE to SD card adapter brackets. This is one that's featured in the classic case build and in the scam case build. This next part's a little tricky and will involve mounting our pass-through adapter. For that, I'm going to be using some E6000 glue and then we'll be topping it off with a little hot glue because I'm a bit impatient. Installs in the back like that. Basically presses all the way back to the edge of the plastic. And then we'll put some hot glue across the top and that will just secure it in place. The next item to install is the Molex plug. Now I've depinned this one just for ease of use. But the way this works is I've modeled in a square to accept the plug and a bit of ease around that that will handle the edges. And as you can see there's a lip along what will now be the top. So I'm going to put some hot glue there and then we'll basically slide it into the device like this, push it down, it fits really good. The glue should snug it up and will inevitably bunch up outside of the plug and all of that will be at the top where you luckily should not see it. There we go. I have a little bit to clean up across the top, but not a big deal. And that concludes all of the initial prep work that we need to do. We can start assembly. This will get installed in two phases. The first one is to get this to slide inside the cage. 
And believe it or not, that's easier said than done. Works a little something like that. So the top piece has a pass-through tab. This is very thin, as you can see, and that it's designed mostly just to center it on top of the bottom piece, and when everything is snug together, it should not move. It goes together like that. And now we take our screws, and we'll lock it in place. In my testing I found it's best to get the screws started and then cinch them, cinch them down once everything has been installed. It's not completely locked down yet, but you can start to see how everything fits together. There was a bit of a gap here for the mounting screws. This is the front of the device. The faceplate should go here. This opening is so that we have cable access. The other side mimics the previous. We have a barrel here that matches top and bottom. And here is the business end. So to get the everything hooked up, power will go down here. Obviously it will fit underneath this bracket. The IDE will have to slide in either from the back and up or through the top and in. For looks, I think it will go in through the top. So now what we need to do is just basically align the top and the bottom. We have some lines there that orient everything. And then we can secure the screws. And just to make sure everything fits perfectly, we have the front bezel. This has a green activity LED. It's black, so we'll have to put that into the badass retro machines. This installs like this and is held in place with four small screws. By installing the faceplate, what I'm doing is aligning mounting holes along the side rails to make sure that the frame is square and that everything is lined up and secured correctly. At this point, we have everything lined up. Final adjustment, make sure everything's square. They do not have to be tight, they just need to be somewhat snug. These rubber, these rubber dampers here actually have a piece of metal that goes all the way through to make sure that the rubber piece does not get completely compressed, which works to our advantage. Good alignment in the back. It's a little off, but not going to matter too much. Have a good alignment on the side. And the nice thing about where I split the two pieces is that when it's together, you're hard pressed to see where the seam is. And I didn't really do any sort of cleanup on these edges at all. Came right off the printer just like that. And now for the just because modification. We have a hardware asylum vinyl. I'm going to cut this out and we'll place it in the bottom part to match my previous design. Thank you. 
Now we have an issue of power that we have to solve. And for that, I picked up a couple of these, actually a whole box of them. And this is a Molex, which is the D-pinned one that I used in the drive to dual SATA. It's basically a SATA power splitter. The SATA power will work great for our SD to SATA adapter. However, for our IDE to SATA adapter, we need to have the floppy style power. So we're going to be modifying this splitter, put a different power connection on it, and then we can install the power. Going back into the big bag of cables. I was able to find this splitter in my pack of wires, so I'm going to use this instead. That way I'm not destroying an entire cable that I might be able to use in another power supply mod. And we've seen this process before. I'm basically going to cut this off and I will cut one of these off and splice it in and then we will be done. Now like that we have a new cable. This has the floppy Molex on one end and the SATA plug on the other. And a little bit of heat shrink tubing where I made these splices. The last item needed to make this project work is a SATA cable. Now my adapter came with a SATA cable like this, which is orange and very thick and not very flexible. And I'm sure I can make that work in this device. However, Silverstone has a much better solution, which is the SST CP 11B-300. This is a 300 millimeter long, super thin SATA cable. It comes with 90 degree ends and should work perfectly with our project. I reviewed the older version of this SATA cable on Hardware Asylum or Ninja Lane. Back then the shielding was a light blue where you could see the metal wrapping underneath. The cables are really super flexible as you can see. And they work great in custom builds where you have SATA plugs exposed. You can plug these in and route the wire around. You don't have a really thick SATA cable messing up the interior of your build. To make this work, we need to connect to the SATA plug on the adapter that is furthest away from the power, that is this one. If we had this reversed, like if we were plugging into a hard drive, we'd use this connection. There we have all the electronics installed. Might need to do a little bit with cable management, but for the most part, you're not gonna see this side of the drive unless you are replacing the SD card. Final step will be to put the lid on. And there we have the finished drive. The last step in this project is to do some testing. Now for that I'll be using a 64 gigabyte Lexar SD card. This is a 1667X with a maximum transfer of 250 megabits a second. The system will be a Pentium 2 333. And keep in mind there are several limitations here. Obviously we cannot go any faster than the IDE interface. And on the 440BX chipset it was an ATA33 or 33 megabits a second. One of the other limitations I noted is that the SATA to SD card adapter has a limitation of 30 gigabytes. I can install a 64 gigabyte card, but, but my system will only see 30 gigabytes of that. Hope you enjoyed watching this project as much as I had building it. Of course, if you have any questions, please put them in the comments below. Be sure to check out Hardware Asylum for a full write-up on this project. And as always, thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing, and I'll see you in the next one.